Beautiful. Turn in your Bible, please, to Genesis chapter 10. While you're finding Genesis 10, uh, we're going through the book of Genesis. That's why we're there today. And uh, we're making our way through all 50 chapters. So here we are, one-fifth of the way, chapter 10 today. And, uh, of course, the flood's over. There was a global flood, as is recorded in chapter uh, 6, 7, 8, after that flood wiped out the world's total population with the exception of Noah and his family, isn't it amazing that all the people and all the nations on this planet come from those three boys, the three sons of Noah? What's their names? Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Uh, I guess that's their age order. But anyway, those three boys. And you see that. Look at the first verse in chapter 10. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born, notice this, after the flood. And then the last verse of this 10th chapter, verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So, you know what I get from that? That all ethnic groups and all nations that ever exist were in the DNA of those three boys. And despite the diversity, there is real unity in the human race, because we're all made by one creator. And you know, when you realize this, we're, we're all cousins. When you realize this, it ought to just completely obliterate any racism. Because we're all one. We're all related. And this couldn't be any clearer than right here. It's interesting also to me, that there are 70 nations that are mentioned in this 10th chapter. 70 nations, and that's significant in, uh, in Jewish thought as well. And so here we have it, and remember Jesus, he sent out 70 in Luke chapter 10 as well. But uh, one of the things that I will not do is... Uh, try to identify all of these sons with modern nations or names. Can't do that. And plus, I don't believe that this is a complete list as well. It wasn't meant to be. But I can say this, these boys, they were fruitful. And that was actually the mandate that God gave to them after they came out of the ark Chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, or spread out over all the earth. And eventually these guys did. Uh, there's a little problem, we'll see that next week, where they didn't do it and they all tried to huddle together in a place called uh, Babel, and uh, we'll touch on, on that in the future. But all the families of the earth. It's all right here. This chapter is called the Table of Nations, by the way. I have uh, one of my daughters is very interested in our family's ancestry, and she got a gift of uh, uh, one of these websites, and she's been sharing information uh, with us every once in a while. And, you know, it is intriguing. It is interesting to, to trace your roots, uh, to go back and find out uh, about your ancestors. What we have here is an ancestry, a national ancestry. Is, is actually, this table of nations is an ancestry. It's a geographical uh, discussion. It is a, a history lesson of the nations of the world. And when you do a quick scan of Genesis chapter 10, what you find is right at the center of all of these nations is a chosen people group. And that chosen people group, out of that will emerge 
the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, a seed, capital S, that will crush the serpent's head. That's what you have to keep in mind when you look at this table of nations here in chapter 10. How does all of this relate to that little nation called Israel or the Jewish people? Because that's what it's about. Let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll ask the Lord to guide us through the rest of this time. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Scripture. Thank you for this very ancient and yet very pertinent passage today. And I pray that you'll use it in our hearts. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say to us as individuals. Lord, I'm thankful for people, the people that you've placed on this planet. And we're all needy people. And we need a relationship with you. And we need you in our life, especially now. People ought to see that we need you. And Lord, I pray that as a result of our time uh, spent in this passage, that you'll draw us to yourself because that's what you desire to do more than anything else. Spirit of God, I take. I thank you that you undertake. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's look at some names here uh, as we begin in this table of nations. And one of the first uh, names is Japheth. He pops up in the uh, second through the fifth verse. Very short uh, uh, regarding Japheth. He is said to be uh, the father of several boys. Uh, The Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Tiras, And then we have the sons of Gomer that are listed. And would you look in verse 3 and see the first son of Gomer is Ashkenaz? Does that ring a bell? Actually, it probably refers to Europeans and specifically German Europeans. However, we know we know that there are two main ethnic branches of Jewish people. There are Sephardic Jewish people, and then there are Ashkenazim, Ashkenazim, I guess you would call them. What are they? Actually, the Ashkenazis are the largest part of the Jewish people, the largest population, so 90, 80 to 90 percent. And they are Jewish people that hail from Europe, uh, Eastern Europe and Germany. And so I think that that's significant to at least say that current European Jews are called Ashkenazi. And then also I want you to note the son Javon that is mentioned in verse 2. Um, his descendants are described in this way. They are described as people that spread out. By the way, I'm not sure about any of this, uh, but the scholars say that Javon uh, is where we get uh, our word uh, I own from, and that these are the people that settled Greece. Don't know. Interesting thought, nonetheless. But look at verse 5. By these, that is the sons of Javon, verse 4, By these, verse 5, were the isles of the Gentiles, the Goyim, divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, that's language, and after their families, that's clans or tribes, and in their nations. Very interesting that the descendants of Javon spread out and uh, they created their own language, their own ethnic group, their own national identity. Now, that's why this 10th chapter is more than a genealogy, because genealogies do not uh, uh, give name. they only give names, they don't give clans and, and languages and territories and, and cities and nations and empires. This is a national ancestry. I guess you would call it. Look at the next son with me. His name is Ham. We pick up Ham in verse 6, and uh, his uh, information runs down to verse 20. 
Obviously, we're not do- going verse by verse in this, but I did want you to see some significant things about Ham. Ham, uh, I should say this. Uh, I failed to, to mention this, and I wanted to. So let me just jump back to Japheth a moment. Japheth, Japheth is the son of Noah, who his descendants went north and west of the land of Canaan, and they, they dispersed from India to Europe. And uh, as a result, they're called the Indo-Europeans. Uh, uh, they are really the goyim. They really are the backbone of Gentile nations, okay? That's Japheth, his descendants. Now Ham, where we pick up in verse 6, Ham, his descendants, uh, they dwelt in the land of Canaan, as well as lands southward of that, i.e. North Africa, in fact, his uh, son Cush, uh, he inhabited a place called Ethiopia, not the modern country, obviously. Mizraim, he, that's the word for Egypt. And his son Put may actually have uh, settled Libya. Ham's descendants would have not only been in Canaan, but also, as I said, southward, North Africa, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Yemen, all of these would have been the sons of Ham and their descendants. But I want you to look in verse 8 and 9 with me, because there is a significant son of of Ham, uh, Cush, the son of Ham. He had a son named Nimrod. See that in verse 8? It says, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Imrod, uh, Nimrod, the, the mighty hunter before the Lord, Nimrod is a key individual in this genealogy because he is, as uh, the scripture says here, his name means revolt. And in the context here, you get the impression that he stirred revolution in order to overwhelm the existing order. In other words, his name is descriptive of his basic character trait. Such like this, there is a man by the name of Karl Marx, and Karl Marx is is known as the founder of Marxism. You might say there is a man named Nimrod, and he is the founder of Nimrodism. Well, what is Nimrodism? Well, Nimrodism is he's a revolutionary, like Marx was. He's a revolutionary, and it says he was a mighty man. He was, as the Hebrew puts it, a gabor, a mighty man. It's the same word that was used to describe that uh, those mighty men in Genesis chapter 6 that were part of the people that God had to destroy. He was a mighty man. In other words, he was a powerful and ruthless tyrant. He's the kind of of man that uh, the psalmist mentions in Psalm 52, same word. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? Same description here of Nimrod. An arrogant, powerful, ruthless tyrant. Notice, he's a mighty hunter before the Lord, literally, He is a hunter of men. He hunts down people. He conquers people in order to enslave them. That's what it means when it says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. In other words, here is a man that is an empire builder, and he does it through uh, just raw power, uh, a Machiavellian type, and he is a man that... uh, that is the originator of world empires. Look at verses 10 and 11, if you will. And uh, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. We'll learn a little bit more about that next week in chapter 11. And uh, also it says in verse 11, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. And we know that to be eventually the kingdom of Assyria. And so you have... Babel, which is the basis for eventually the country of Babylonia, and then you have uh, Nineveh, 
which is the capital eventually of what became known as Assyria. You have Babylonia and Assyria, empires with Nimrod's uh, uh, character, which epitomized and promoted worldliness, political uh, skill uh, with powerful rule. He is responsible here for building eight major cities, four in the plain of Shinar, which is Babylonia, and then four in Assyria. So he's a, he's a mighty man in that sense. And uh, I think these two are mentioned here, especially because of their important connection to Israel. You know, God used both Assyria first and then Babylon, uh, Babylon next to chasten his rebellious firstborn son, Israel. And so this is how this fits into this. And then in verses 15 and 19, we have the, the son of Ham called Canaan, and where he and his descendants settled. And basically, the Cain, Canaanites, or Canaanites, they settled what today is the land of Israel, and what today is the land of, of Syria and Lebanon, in fact, Zidon is mentioned here in this section of verses 15 to 19. So here we have Canaan's cities and tribes. They mainly occupied what is today the land of Israel, the land that was promised to the Jewish people, and that's what's significant here. Remember last week when we looked at chapter 9, how that... Uh, Ham's, uh, the son of Noah, disrespected and dishonored his father, Noah. And God said through Noah, your son, Ham, your son, Canaan, he's going to be disrespected and dishonored. He's going to be the lowest of servants. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, they occupied the, the, the promised land, and they, they were the people that the nation of Israel, when they were given occupation of that land, were commanded to drive them out and destroy them and possess their land. They were the people that God said to Abram, in 400 years after your people are enslaved in Egypt, I'm going to send them forth, and they're going to occupy that promised land because all the sins of these Canaanite tribes will have built up no repentance, will have built up, and I'm going to vomit them out of the land by having you take them out and possess the land. So that's Ham. One more son. His name is Shem, and his uh, heritage and uh, ancestry and, and nations uh, that come out of him, verses 21 to 31. And basically, oversimplification perhaps, but basically Shem, he is the progenitor of, he is the ancestor of the Jewish and the Arab people. Isn't it ironic that so many of the Arab people, let's say, for instance, Palestinians, hate Jewish people, but yet <laughs> they're cousins. Uh, they're half-brothers. They're even closer than cousins. They're half-brothers. They're, they're both of their father is Abraham. And they come from this same father, Shem, as well. And they're li here's Shem, though he... Uh, is older, he's listed last, and I think because the rest of the book of Genesis really focuses on this line of Shem, and a key descendant of Shem that is mentioned, uh, we'll see him next week, in chapter 11 uh, and uh, verse 10, uh, there is a man by the name of Arphaxad, and then in the, I think it's the 26th verse of chapter 11, uh, one of his descendants is a man named, named Abram. But anyway, this is why Shem is the last son whose uh, uh, genealogy and nations are mentioned here, national ancestry. And, uh, of course, the key person is Abram. But of the five sons mentioned in this passage that were born to Shem, one is emphasized. And his name is uh, Arphaxad. 
And uh, he is the grandfather of a man named Eber. In the same line, in verse 25 of chapter 10, it says, Unto Eber were born two sons. And the name of one was Peleg, for his, in his days the earth was divided. Peleg, his name means division. And uh, most Bible scholars believe that it is a reference to the 11th chapter of Genesis and the Tower of Babel when the, the tribes of people were divided because of the confusion of languages that God brought upon these people because they were rebelling against him and not obeying. So uh, there's Peleg. And then uh, this man, Eber, or Eber, his name is from the root verb that means to pass over, to pass through, or to go across. And I think it's a reference to the region across the Euphrates River. Even the word Hebrew, we believe, is derived from this same root word, the name Eber. And in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 3, that's the first reference to anyone being called a Hebrew. And, it's, and it is Abram who is referred to as a Hebrew, as, I think, one who has passed over, one who has crossed over the Euphrates River uh, to Canaan. And he becomes known, of course, as the father of the Hebrew people, of the crossers over, you might say. So that's the names that I wanted to deal with. Now will you take your Bible as we finish up this morning and turn to Acts chapter 17 where we read and I want to talk about nations, because this chapter is all about the table of nations. So I want to see God's attitude toward nations. God takes special personal interest in and care of nations. God thinks that nationality is important. And I think we see this here in this 17th chapter. One of the things I want you to note in verse 24 of Acts chapter 17, it says, And God made the world and all things therein. And then look at uh, the first phrase in verse 26. And hath made, that is God, hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. The first thing I want you to note about God and nations is that he's the creator of them. God is the creator of nations. He's the one that devised the very, uh, the, the very concept and designed nations on this earth. And that despite the external differences between nations and national contributions that differ, we're all one human family. Uh, e pluribus unum, out of many, one as uh, is our motto, a unity in diversity, because God's the creator of all nations. But I want you to see something else in verse 26, read on. And hath determined, God hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God is not only the creator of nations, he's the ruler of nations. He controls everything that pertains to nations, he is control over all nations. He, it says, determines the time that nations will exist, their historical opportunity on this planet. As well, it says, not only does he determine the beginning and the end of nations, but he also orders their geographical location and their boundaries. Listen, you can't have a nation without boundaries. And God has set the boundaries of nations. That's God's doing. If you're anti-borders for a nation, you're against God's plan. God says that I've set the boundaries of nations. So God's the creator of nations. God's the ruler of nations. He's also the blesser of nations. Look at verse 25, the second part of it. It says, uh, talking about God not needing to be... Uh, to have uh, things given to him for his sustenance, but rather it's the opposite. It's the other way around. He gives to all life and breath and all things. God is the great blesser of 
people and of nations. He is the one that sustains nations. And then look at this. What he's really concerned about as far as blessing goes. Uh, look at verse 27 and 28. Here's why God has brought nations to exist at a certain time in history, gave them certain boundaries. Here's why, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And so God is the blesser of nations. God sustains nations. God reaches out to the nations. God draws near to the nations. God motivates nations to search after him. That's his plan. And beginning in Genesis chapter 12, the Jewish people become the center of God's plan on this earth to bring blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's why God said, I want Israel to be a light to the nations. And he has made Israel to be a light to the nations through Messiah Jesus, who comes out of the loins of Abraham. It's amazing. God's the blesser of nations. God wants nations to find him. God wants to have a relationship with people and with nations. Nothing would please God better than that this nation would turn back to him. Nothing would please God more than that the Jewish people would recognize that Jesus is their Messiah and wants to bless them like they've never been blessed before. And one day it's going to be seen. It's going to happen because God said it. But there's one final thought here in Acts 17 and verse 30 and 31 that I want to end on. God is not only the creator of nations, the ruler of nations, the blesser of nations, but he's the judge of all nations. Verse 30 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world, all nations, in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that they will be judged, and that he raised that judge from the dead. Our Lord Jesus. God is most concerned about nations' eternal destiny. God is burdened for you. God is burdened for you, and God's burdened for your people. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's burden for you and your people. God's more burdened for your people than you are. God commands you and your people to repent. He commands repentance because there's a future judgment upon nations coming. The Bible says that all the nations that forget God will be turned into hell. That's why God says, I've commanded all men everywhere to repent. And the Bible says, of course, because nations are made up of individuals, that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so this is a call to repentance. God cares about you. God cares about your people. And he calls both to repentance. He wants to save you. He wants to save your people. He wants to save your family. He wants to save your countrymen. He wants to save your neighbors. He wants to save your co-workers and your colleagues. He wants to save your city. He wants to save your country. He wants to save the nations of this earth. William Carey had to overcome great odds in order to obey the call of God to take the gospel to the country of India back in the 1700s. In the book, The Challenge of Life by Oswald J. Smith, Smith noted that 
and I quote, even the directors of the East India Company oppose Carey's work. Following then, he says, is the idiotic resolution they presented to Parliament. And I quote, the sending out of missionaries into one eastern possession is the maddest, most extravagant, most costly, most indefensible project which has ever been suggested by a moonstruck fanatic, unquote. Smith added, in 1796, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland passed the following infamous resolution, and I quote, to spread the knowledge of the gospel amongst barbarians and heathens seems to be highly preposterous. One speaker in the House of Commons said that he would rather see a band of devils let loose in India than a band of missionaries. Such was the opposition to missions when Carey set forth. And yet, he was able to write, and I quote, Why is my soul disquieted within me? Things may turn out better than I expect. Everything is known to God and God cares, unquote. That in itself should tell us why William Carey has become known as the father of modern missions. Jonathan Edwards when speaking of a revival, said that revivals are, strat are strategic in revealing the purpose of God because they were God's way of shepherding history toward the great climax. I think if there's anything that we ought to be doing, we ought to be reaching out to the nations of this earth through missions. We ought to be reaching out to people through our own, evangelist our own evangelistic practices. We ought to also be praying that God would sweep once again through this entire world in a great spiritual awakening. That We ought to believe God for that. We ought to believe that the day is not past when God will do that. And we ought to pray that he would revive our hearts to the place that we could believe him for such a work of God to be done in these days. Let's pause in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful today for the opportunity to preach your word as we have. Thank you for your special, the special place in your heart for nations and for people. Lord, you love us. And you've done so much to try to communicate your love to us. There might be people out there this morning that are very discouraged and feeling as if no one loves them. Lord, May they lift their eyes and look at Jesus, and may they see your great love for them in that you love the world, you love the nations of this world, you love the people of this world so much that you gave heaven's best, your only begotten Son. You said that whoever, whoever, Jew or Gentile, wherever, whatever nation, whoever believes upon him, believes that he died to pay their sin debt, believes that he shed his blood that they might be washed clean from sin. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. You said that you will turn the nation of this world into hell if they do not repent. Lord, they need not perish, but have everlasting life. May that be May that be our desire. May that be the message that uh, beams forth from us all the time. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful plan of rescuing a fallen race, a human race. We thank you and ask this in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed yet, has God spoken to your heart? Has he spoken to you in, in a specific way? Are you a saved person? Are you saved? Do you know that you have eternal life? Have you ever trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Why don't you do that right now? Just admit to him, if you haven't ever done this, admit to him that you're a lost sinner, that your sin is dragging you down to hell, and that you believe that Jesus already paid your sin for you on that cross, and invite him to forgive you and be your Savior today.